The story goes like this. <clears throat> there once was a man in San Francisco walking along the Golden Gate Bridge. And he saw a second man about to jump over the edge. He stopped him and said, surely it can't be that bad. You know God loves you. The man about to jump got a tear in his eye. He said, are you a Christian or a Jew, a Muslim or a Hindu? The fellow said, I'm a Christian. Me too. Are you Protestant or Catholic? I'm Protestant. I am too. What franchise? I'm Baptist. So am I. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? Northern Baptist. That's a miracle. I am too. Are you Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? Northern Conservative Baptist. Me too. Are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Northern Conservative Reform Baptist? I'm Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Carl Ripley. Me too. Are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Eastern Region? I'm the Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region. So am I. Are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1897 or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lake Region Council of 1912? I'm Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And the guy said, Die, heretic! <laughs> Threw him over the bridge. doesn't take that much, does it, to make people fight with one another, even Christians, all born by the same grace of God, the Spirit of Christ. I'm sure that there are a lot of people in this room with scars to prove it, and I suspect some of us have scarred some other people. I am deeply deeply grateful to the Lord Jesus Christ for the general peace in this congregation. It is a wonder and a gift for us all. But we've had our moments, and we will have our moments. But I am so thankful for the peace that we have in Christ. We're as prone as anybody to fighting with each other, and we all need to be constantly vigilant. We're consistently bringing new people into this congregation, mixing with the longer tenured folks, and it isn't as easy as a handshake and a directory, is it? We each come to this church with a particular set of convictions, and many of them are different. We all come with baggage and perspectives that can do damage or get in the way. Let's face it, we each come with some sin sinful inclinations that could really hurt. And so one may say that you and I are probably not entirely to be trusted if we should meet one another on a bridge. The Corinthian church was sliced and diced by divisions. This letter was written roughly A.D. 50 to a very gifted church. But as you read 1 Corinthians, the range of things that they could fight about is truly breathtaking, especially among people who apparently found Christ to save them. We all need this book right now, not because we're splintering, but because we're capable of splintering. And because good things are happening in terms of growth and worship, we need this because whenever things go well in ministry, the enemy attacks. This book will help us connect with, with each other well. Beyond our walls, we are daily tossed about by admonitions telling us diversity of opinion is wonderful and the pearl of great price. 
that which is to be desired of all things, yet at the very same time in our society and in our churches, we are seeing them being torn viciously apart and shredded by differences of opinion. Those differences used to be mainly in the church theological and are now ideological and or political as well. Why? Because diversity of opinion is only constructive when there is a commonly held fundamental bedrock of convictions, values, and beliefs that hold those differences in perspective, in check, and in balance. Otherwise, diversity is deadly. Jesus said in Mark 3.25, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. We are witnessing the disintegration of the fabric of our society for this very reason. Now in this moment of history, both for the church and for our nation, we must send out a clarion call for unity. We must lift up, especially in the church, that which we hold to in common, that which we believe and cling tightly to it. The late General Colin Powell wrote this. On the speech circuit, he said, I tell a story that goes to the heart of America's longing. ABC correspondent Sam Donaldson was interviewing a young African-American soldier in a tank platoon on the eve of the Battle of Desert Storm. Donaldson asked, how do you think the battle will go? Are you afraid? The soldier replied, we'll do okay. We're well trained and I'm not afraid. The GI answered and gestured toward his buddies all around him. And he said, I'm not afraid because I'm with my family. The other soldiers shouted, tell him again, he didn't hear you. The soldier repeated, this is my family and we'll take care of each other. Powell goes on to say that the story never fails to touch me or the audience. It is a metaphor for what we have to do as a nation. He says we have to start thinking of America as a family. We have to start, stop screeching at each other, stop hurting each other, and instead start caring for, sanctifying for, and sharing with each other. We have to stop constantly criticizing, which is the way of the malcontent, and instead get back to the can-do attitude that made America we have to keep on trying and risk failing in order to solve the country's problems. We cannot move forward if cynics and critics swoop down and pick apart anything that goes wrong to a point where we lose sight of what is right, decent, and uniquely good about America. What Colin Powell says about coming together in our nation applies even more emphatically to the body of Christ how? How do we move forward toward that kind of unity? First Corinthians gives us some pointers. It seems like every page of this book is addressing some kind of problem. But the way First Corinthians start, starts is rather startling because it is so positive in the first verses. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours Grace and peace to you 
from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given, given to you in Christ Jesus. Let's start with grace. Grace is a binding agent for us as the people of God. Grace binds us to the body of Christ. Thank God for that grace that binds us together in Jesus. Paul's thinking back to how he saw grace work when he went to Corinth. Corinth was a tough place. It was a wicked city. It was a cosmopolitan city, and it was not friendly to the gospel. And it wasn't very friendly to Paul. He remembers how he came into the city frightened. He'd just been rejected by the philosophers in Athens not far away. He came through the pressures of a government. God moved, and God moved a couple named Aquila and Priscilla to Corinth, a welcoming party, so to speak, for Paul. They even did the same thing. He remembers that with fondness, and he remembers how the Lord arranged for Timothy and Silas to come south to help. He remembers how Christmas, the head of the Jewish synagogue and his entire household came to faith in Jesus. So many other Christians heard him, believed, and were baptized. And this is all recorded in Acts 18. He remembers how, when the work was at its most dangerous and difficult, the Lord appeared to him in a vision, which was a rather rare occurrence for Paul. And God said to him, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack or harm you, because I have many people in this city. So when Paul writes these words, I always thank God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. He has many memories, powerful evidences of God's grace in mind. It took no less grace to bring us together, assembled here this morning. It didn't happen in the same way, but it took just as much grace. Each Christian here has, drawn, has been drawn from their lives from all over and has a unique story and witness of God's grace. Everyone here knows Jesus has, has a different story than that of the person next to you because of what they have done, what he has done in their lives. And yet we all celebrate this grace, this same grace. We are a company of those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Grace is getting what we don't deserve and could never earn. And grace is what builds and binds the church. Grace is the gravity that holds us together. Verses four to six start enumerating some of the benefits that come as a result of God's grace because they're not only true of the Corinthians, they're also true for us. We read, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him, you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. We have been enriched in every way. The, the Apostle Paul says, and it has proven true. What he preached came true. He preached the gospel. People became gospel people. And that's true for us. There's no direction you can turn in your Christian life that has not been enriched by your relationship to Christ. Wherever you look, whatever you think about, Jesus has made you richer. Jesus came and he said uh, that he was going to preach good news to the poor. Well, that's us. We were paupers, one and all, proud, ungrateful people. And because when we're proud and ungrateful, we tend to fight. Thankful people, not so much. So Paul is urging us to remember how rich Jesus has made us, and not only remember, but give thanks. He thanks God. We ought to also. 
Isn't it amazing how Christians can argue about the great acts of God's grace without being thankful? We have lots of folks here who are pretty knowledgeable about theology. We ought to be more thankful, joyful people because of it. For we have studied the theology of the church and we have discovered the great treasures of the church through it. But you know as well as I how much infighting happens in, the world, in that world. How crazy is that? We ought to be the most grateful people and the most grateful people don't tend to quarrel. E. Stanley Jones says, and I quote, talk about what theology you believe and you have this unity. Talk about who you believe in and you will have unity. When we start talking about what Jesus has done for us and what he means to us and how we walk with him and he with us day by day and moment by moment, then we find our unity. We want to go to 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Paul writes, it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has uh, conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed to us by his spirit. In 1 Corinthians 1, 7, therefore do, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. I mean, there have been many times when those new to the church have talked about not only our musicians, but our people, you, and our leadership. And they have said to me, you are so blessed. Oh, yes, we are. Yes, we are. We have everything we need. We must give thanks for that. We were dead people as far as God was concerned, dead in our sins. We were living uh, in an eternity of, with an eternity of dying ahead of us. And then God came through Jesus. When we put our faith in him, we were regenerated, recreated. And in that miracle, the Holy Spirit of Almighty God came to actually live in the hearts of each of us who trust him. The Holy Spirit lives in each of us, and in all of us, God is present, not hovering over us, but working from within us. So here we are, a people who were once not a people, who were orphans at best, spiritually dead at worst, and then as we trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and gives us his resurrection power and binds us and seals us for eternity and brings us together in a church, and this is the body of Christ. These verses emphasize our spiritual security. Let's be thankful because we really don't deserve to be saved, but we are safe. God will keep us safe because he is able and faithful. We read in verse in uh, 1 Corinthians, he will keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and he will keep us. Oh, we don't deserve to be so rich. We don't deserve to be so gifted. And we don't deserve to be so safe, but we are. Gratitude for God's grace binds us together as a church, worshiping together, praying together, studying the Bible together, serving together, and eating meals together are crucial for our hearts which already have so much in common through Christ. And we become intertwined together with our songs and our prayers and our service and our fellowship. When grateful Christians celebrate our spiritual riches together, use our spiritual gifts and orient to our spiritual hope in Christ's return and our eternal life, Christ <clears throat> binds us together in love. And with this in mind, the Apostle Paul switches the subject and he argues for unity, not diversity. He says in verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there may be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united 
in mind and thought. Doesn't seem realistic, does it? Be perfectly united in mind and thought. What are the chances of that? Let there be no divisions among you. The Greek word for divisions is schism. <clears throat> it sounds like a, an axe being sharpened. It means to be cut apart. Paul describes how they were divided. My brothers and sisters come from Chloe's household and have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And they were arguing about who they were going to follow, who their favorite teacher was. Some said Paul, some said Apollos. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they were uh, talking about these different teachers. And Paul and Peter and Apollos were all prominent, of course, in the early church. Paul will say very shortly that he planted in Corinth and Apollos, another great teacher, watered it. He says, but God gave the increase. God gave the increase. The problem wasn't with these guys. It's clear that all these men were powerful personalities and people tend to feel to follow people like that. And it's, <clears throat> they easily brought a different angle, a different approach, a different perspective to the way that they taught the gospel. Not contradictory, just different. But each teacher does that. And the church is better for having a variety of voices and personalities expressing the truth of the gospel. <clears throat> why, do you have, why do you think we have the different gospels for that very purpose? We don't have to agree on every single point. That's not what Paul's saying. That's not possible. Paul and Peter had things they didn't agree on. Paul and Barnabas had disagreements. <clears throat> Remember this. Among those saved by Christ, diversity is good if its cornerstone is Jesus. But without that, diversity is dead. We don't all have to sing the same line, but Jesus really does expect us to harmonize. In verses 1, in verses 13 and 17, rather, Paul says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? You might get the sense from this that Paul didn't think the baptism was important. That's not the case at all. It just wasn't his main thing. Christianity, Christian unity, takes work. And it takes grace from God. Finally, Paul says, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. When we walk away from the cross to form a group, even over theological differences, we have emptied the cross of its power. In unity with Jesus, we prevail over the powers of evil. In the good fight, Mark Buchanan offers spiritual disciplines to help keep fights from scarring your soul. And Buchanan uses a movie scene to describe the necessity of our unity for the church. General Maximus comes to Rome dirty and shattered. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Where's Rome's legendary pageantry to get, greet one of their great war heroes? The, her, her, the pageantry and the, and the armor and the laurel crown, where is that? It was nowhere to be seen because Maximus came as a slave. That's the premise of the movie Gladiator. Through a maze of events, Maximus goes from celebrated warrior, favorite of one emperor, to despised traitor, nemesis of another. It becomes a fugitive, then a caged slave, and then an unvanquished gladiator. Growing in fame in the arena until he is brought to the Colosseum in Rome to face elite warriors. The games open with a reenactment of the Battle of Carthage. The gladiators, all foot soldiers, are cast as the help, helpless Carthians. <clears throat> it's a stage for slaughter. They're marched out a dark passageway into brilliant sunlight and met with a roar of bloodlust. Maximus, their leader, shouts to his men, Stay together. He assembles them in a tight circle in the center of the arena, back to back, shields aloft, spears outward, 
Again, he shouts, whatever comes out of the gate, whatever, stay together. What comes out of that gate is swift and sleek and full of turn. Chariot upon chariot, thunder, thunder forth, war horses pull <clears throat> with deadly agility and earth-shaking strength, wagons driven by master charioteers. Great warriors ride behind with deadly precision, hurl spears and volley arrows. One gladiator, gladiator strays from the circle, ignoring Maximus' order and is cut down. Maximus shouts once again, stay together. The instinct is to scatter the strong, but Maximus exerts his authority and they resist that impulse. The chariots circle closer and closer and closer. Spears and arrows rain down on the men's shields and the chariots are about to cinch the knot. And right then, Maximus shouts, now! The gladiators attack and they decimate the Romans. Whatever comes out of that gate, stay together. That echoes what Jesus prayed for us in his high priestly prayer in John 17. May they be brought to complete unity, meaning you and I. And if we do, he promises us that the gates of hell will not overcome the church. The power of the cross saves us and draws us to Jesus. So if we walk away from that, <clears throat> the cross is being sapped of its extraordinary ability. We're responsible if we let that happen. Salvation only comes because Jesus died for us, and all that enriches us and exalts us and unifies us only comes through the cross of Christ. When Sue and I left the church, we had served for almost 20 years as the founding pastor and wife in Talmadge, Ohio. The reverberations were pretty significant. As we gathered for our final Sunday, some people told me they couldn't imagine how the church could still be their church if I wasn't there. I said to several of them, God is the one who's been working with you and in you. Not me. Not me. Did you think it was me when your heart was stirred? When the word resonated with your soul? Did you think that was me? That wasn't me. That was God. Did you think it was me who knew just when to get a word of encouragement or a scripture? or a gentle touch. Do you think it was me who moved you forward in Christ? Did you think it was me? No. It was Jesus. And he will still be with you. It isn't any of our pastors or teachers who will do these things. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and we will be a church worthy of his name if we remember that. Nothing is so powerfully unified than the presence and the peace of Jesus. We must be unified in the confession of our basic beliefs. We must stand boldly and we must be united in the presence of Christ our Savior. And if we are, then there is nothing in this world that we cannot overcome and through which we can prevail. And all God's people said, Amen. Heavenly Father, draw us now to yourself away from our own inclination, our own venues, our own agendas and give us but one thing give us Jesus 
in his name.